Shall we get started? Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the first uh, new faculty lecture series event of, of, the, of the year. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our, our new faculty speaker today, Galen Reeves. Uh, please continue to enjoy your lunches. Uh, I'm very pleased to see such a, a great turnout. Uh, this, is a, this is a talk on sparse data, but this is not a sparse audience, which is a nice thing to see. Let me tell you a little bit about uh, Galen. He's a, an assistant professor with a joint appointment in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering and the Department of Statistical Science. He is uh, part of the interdisciplinary gang of faculty who are over at the, the newly uh, remodeled Gross Hall in the IID space, Information Initiative at Duke space. Uh, he completed his PhD in Electrical Engineering and Computer Sciences at uh, Berkeley in 2011. Uh, from 2011 to 2013, he was a postdoc at, in the Department of Statistics at Stanford. He has also had visiting appointments at various times at EPFL in Switzerland, at the Technical University of Delft in the, in the Netherlands, and in the Network Embedded Computing Group at Microsoft Research, so he gets around. And he did his undergraduate degree in electrical and computer engineering at Cornell. Uh, I think his talk today is about robust compressed sensing. And this is probably a fairly knowledgeable audience, but it's a broad audience. So for those who don't know, you're all familiar with, with uh, compressing data through things like uh, JPEG. Uh, once you have the data, how you can compress a file. The idea behind compressed sensing is, can you compress it before you take the data? Can you, can you sense less than you thought you needed in order to get the same information? And uh, I think... Uh, Galen's going to tell us about this exciting new field, about, about um, the state of the art in that, and, and hopefully how it, how it will lead to applications uh, like shorter time spent in the MRI. He tells me that's, that's really true, but there are some other promises of the, of the field that may or may not be true, and he's going to debunk those for us. So please welcome Galen Reeves. Okay. All right, thank you very much. So to kind of start our story, Right? It's become increasingly clear that many kind of high dimensional problems, that is things built on large data, with a lot of components, have some lower structure. So this is true kind of across areas such as signal processing, statistics, utilized in machine learning, and it's kind of borne out by a lot of kind of with more computational power, more data, we have these high dimensional problems, we have to figure out if we want to do something, if we want to make use of them, kind of get big insights from them, we need to figure out ways to take advantage of any inherent low dimensional structure. So one example, right, could be medical imaging. If you want high-resolution images, right, you want to harness something you know about the inside of people's brains or heads. Hopefully it's not just random noise going on here. There's some structure that you can use. Maybe another example is in data center monitoring. So this is a problem where you typically can have, you know, thousands of computers running in a, a data center generating hundreds of performance counters uh, every minute. And you want to know how is this performance... Uh, how is this data center running? Is it about to crash, or, or do you have way too many servers running? You should turn some off to save power. Here again, kind of the state of the system is a very high dimensional signal. Just to ask questions about it to communicate it, you want to use some lower dimensional structure. These are just two examples, but I mean, kind of the, the whole range of applications is very large, right? So low rank matrix recovery, the applications such as the Netflix challenge, social networks, huge applications in biology. Um, and kind of all this, you know, you could argue, part, you know, corresponds to the idea under big data. So this isn't going to be a talk about applications. I just want to kind of set the stage and say this is where these problems are coming from, right? Large problems, a lot of unknowns, and we may have a limited measurement of knowns uh, that we can work with. All right, so let's concentrate on the single concept of kind of, of estimating an unknown signal. So out there, we can think of our unknown signal as a vector. Okay? So each of these components, right, that are different colors, represent unknown values in this vector. To recover the signal, we want to get these values. We observe it through some sensing system, which does some transform of our unknown signal, adds noise, there's, there's always noise, and then we get what we observe. And as I drew it here, kind of the number of observations, right, the length, our observations is a vector where we have kind of one observed value, value for each unknown value. Given what we know, right, we want to do some, something intelligent and get back to the unknown. And that's the goal of inference. And so maybe we can produce some estimate. 
So what happens if the number, kind of the dimensionality of what we want, the length of our vector x, the number of unknowns is significantly larger than the number of measurements. So we just, we don't have access to all the measurements. All right. This, you can think of as compressed sensing. Or equivalently, as I'm going to talk about in this, tack, this talk, somehow we have undersampled the data. All right. We just kind of critically sampled it if we had an equal number of knowns per unknown. But it's undersampled here, fewer knowns than unknowns. Um, so these problems have been around for a while, actually, right? I mean, we've, we've always been trying to learn more about the world around us based on what we know. And sometimes we're in the undersampled setting. The problem is, is that, you know, since for 200 years, since people have been doing uh, least squares, <coughs> you say you, you, you have an inherent um, issue which is how do you recover more unknowns from fewer unknowns? So there's kind of three keys that will make compressed sensing work, three key ingredients. Right? The first is you want the unknown signal to not be too complex. It's constrained. So maybe it lives in some class of known signals. Maybe it has a known distribution. Maybe it's sparse, right? A few of the entries are significant. Most are close to zero. Uh, maybe it's compressible. Okay, so this is first you need is some inherent um, redundancy in your signal that you can take advantage of. Kind of the second key is you need some incoherence in your sensing system. Okay, if you have some, a signal that's sparse and you just look at a few components of this signal, it's very possible that you're going to miss large non-zero components. You're going to miss the important information and you can never recover it. So that's an example of coherent sampling. What you need is incoherence, where this doesn't happen. Somehow your measurements touch all the unknowns. Finally, kind of the missing, the third key ingredient you need is a recovery algorithm. And in particular, in the compressed sensing setting, it turns out you need nonlinear recovery algorithms. Right? So this is kind of a change in thinking from kind of just using linear recovery methods, which have been very popular for a couple hundred years. All right, what's the problem with going to nonlinear methods, though? Recovery. Well, we have noise. And the issue is that when you go nonlinear recovery and there's noise, you worry about stability, right? Is it the case that maybe a small change in your measurements, a small perturbation of what you're seeing, can make a large change in your estimate? Okay, that's, in that case, it's unstable. What you want is stability. Small changes in your, your, your observations correspond to small changes in what you're recovering, and hopefully what you're recovering is close to the true unknown signal. All right, let's give a specific application of where this works. So one is um, magnetic resonance imaging. Here, again, what we might be trying to see is the inside of your head is our unknown signal. Um, incoherent sampling. And the MRI is actually going to be sampling kind of the, these pixel locations, not in the, the, the physical dimension, but in a transformed space, in K space. And this is incoherent with the physical space. Okay, our observations, in fact, are going to look like this in the case space. And you apply some recovery algorithm and hopefully try and get out an accurate representation of what's going on inside of you. So here we have incoherent measurements. The recovery algorithm, this is something that's done, uh, it's a nonlinear recovery algorithm. And you may argue, well, we need some type of, as I said, sparsity or compressibility in our signal, right? So it, you might say this is sparse, right? There's a lot of areas that are black, but you might argue it's not really that sparse. There's a lot of areas that aren't black, a lot of pixel values in between. But it's a natural image, and as long as it's sparse in some domain, so typically we expect this to be sparse in, say, a wavelet domain, we can, this is enough. We can take advantage of it. So what does this mean here in the whole compressed sensing setting, right? Fewer measurements. Well, this translates into faster scans, all right? If you can, if you can get the same resolution in a fraction of the time you could before, then you can actually do lots of things you couldn't do, right? You can, you can get MRIs of kids who don't want to sit still for 30 minutes. You can get more people through. In fact, sitting in the MRI, just getting all these acquisitions, sitting there to get measurement after measurement after measurement is one of the big costs in running the whole thing. So, and again, just to, to drive home the point that this is, you know, there exist real positive benefits of this theory is, you know, to say that there's been actual trial, a clinical study, where you compare compressed sensing methods using, um, sorry, recovery using compressed sensing methods versus the status quo, and in fact, it's significantly better. All right, so 
the idea of compressed sensing, getting away with the kind of fewer measurements than unknown, it's not entirely new, right? People have been doing it in practice for years. Right? Particularly, I think, in the, uh, you know, in the 70s with oil exploration, they realized that you could get much sharper images if you kind of look for sparse solutions rather than just a minimum L2 solution. Um, and these ideas kind of came from a, a large number of fields. I mean, this is just a, you know, a subsampling, but you know, the ideas that people were saying, okay, we can do spectrum-blind sampling or um, sketching and kind of how somehow you can, you can recover from these compressed measurements. Kind of the point is, is that though well, there have been a number of ideas, sparsity is a component, right? Remember I said these three keys, kind of what, when it all took together is when you had theory. So at around 2004, I guess I put the citation when the final papers came out, there were these papers by um, Donahoe and Candes and Tao and Romberg, which said theoretically, everything people had been doing for a while with this undersampling, it was justified. Okay, prior to theory, people were doing it, but there was skepticism. People would say, aren't you violating Nyquist? I don't think you can actually recover in this regime and have it be meaningful, right? I'm suspicious of what you're doing. Okay? But then along came theory and said, actually, there's some, there some theorems. Under certain conditions, this works. You can get away with these fewer, fewer measurements. And this led to an explosion in research. All right? Now people are allowed to undersample. You've been given the go-ahead. And so maybe I just put some citations here kind of just showing right, the, the steep increase in research in this field and also on kind of the, the both axes, both kind of, which is kind of the general sense in blue and also kind of just if you consider applications uh, within PubMed. You know, has a similar curve, though on a different scale. All right, so the takeaway point is, is, is theory here is, is helpful. It, it directs a way for people to think about these problems, know what you can do, and, and have confidence that what you're doing makes sense. Let me talk about a specific compressed sensing model. So this is the K-sparse model. Here we're going to think about our unknown as being exactly sparse. That is, it has at most K non-zero entries. And we're going to sense it using a matrix. Okay, so this is a linear sensing method, and we'll have noise and get our, our fewer measurements. All right, so what is, what is this, what type of problem do we have here? If we, what we observe is the matrix and our measurements. What's unknown is the signal and the noise. Okay, what is this setup? This is a system of noisy and underdetermined linear equations. In the absence of any noise, it's just a system of underdetermined linear equations, right? We know we have an infinite number of solutions. Yeah, we have noise. That's going to make it more difficult. And so the comp problem of compressed sensing is to say, kind of, how can we recover a sparse X from this system? So here's a, a basic question, right? If we want to know how, how far can we go, is how many measurements do we need? How many measurements do we need to recover a K-sparse unknown signal? If you can answer this question, right, you've, you've completed compressed sensing. You've, you've, you've done everything, right? Okay, any, any guesses? I'll make it easier. Let's say there's no noise. How many measurements do you need? I'm going to say there's zero noise. So I'm going to say you, you, you just given a system of underdetermined linear equations. You know the matrix. You know the vector is k-sparse, but you don't know what it is. You get exact measurements. 10K, so 10K, oh, 3K. You, so we have a suggestion which is 3K. Are you not worried about the fact that there are N unknowns? So I heard a log N, K log N. Okay, we heard K log N a lot in compressed sensing. Maybe another number we've heard is K log N over K. But... I don't know. Tom's saying just something proportional to K. OK, there's no noise, K plus 1. Right. So some sleight of hand here. I'm going to say that we're allowed to choose our, our matrix randomly and independently of the vector. Otherwise, you need 2K. But the remarkable thing is it's only K plus 1. There's no dependence on the number of unknowns. And this isn't hard to show. This is just a fact of, of linear algebra. So why, is, why are there thousands of papers in compressed sensing? Okay. Well, there's a, few, there's a few things here. First, 
Such recovery is NP-hard. You have to look through an exponential number of subsets. Secondly, it's unstable. Right? What happens if you add noise? I said there's no noise. If there's noise, do you expect this to hold? And thirdly, come on, do you think the inside of your head is exactly k-sparse even in a wavelet domain? Right? Things aren't exactly k-sparse. Right? So, so this, if you want, is a fundamental result. Okay, it's great, but what can we do that's useful? And so this is where the thousands of papers have kind of been looking. And so here's just, again, a, a, some of the, 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 the bounds in the literature. If you want to do compressed sensing, right, and you have your, your algorithm, you say, okay, I have my linear sensing matrix, great. I know my recovery algorithm, I'm going to use lasso. That's what everyone's using in compressed sensing. Uh, okay, how many measurements do I need? Let me look it up in the theory. And what you'll find is, well, it depends on your recovery task. It depends on a lot of conditions. It depends on properties of your matrix. Um, and what you'll get are these bounds. Now, I want, to, I want to emphasize something about these bounds. So on the second column, it says measurements. And the number of measurements, I, I write big O of k log n over k, or, or big omega. Right? These are asymptotic bounds. These are saying that if your kind of number of measurements, number of unknowns, and number of non-zero scales in a way bounded by some unnamed but finite constant, then the, you know, the probability of recovery will tend to, uh, of successful recovery will tend to one in some appropriate limit. So this is the theoretical evidence saying, oh yeah, you can do this. Right? In some conditions it will work. But if you want to apply your algorithm and, and you actually want to do something, I, I would argue that, well, these results are, are comforting at some level. They don't tell you much. Right? In your problem, you have a fraction of measurements. You have some assumed fraction of sparsity. These aren't order results. Your problem's not necessarily growing. right? You have a fixed thing. You want to know how well will it do. How many measurements should I take? What trade-off should I have? In fact, there's a whole host of engineering questions. Right? What is the exact accuracy I'm going to get? It could be two different algorithms with the same scaling behavior. You know, the compressed sensing results look the same when stated in terms of asymptotic bounds, but the performance is wildly different depending on the, you know, the operating regime or maybe even just the tuning of the parameters. I mean, we're engineers. If you want to optimize something, right, you have to ask, well, maybe I could get away with fewer measurements. But maybe the cost in S and R to do so is overwhelmingly high. So maybe you're actually happy with, with you know, a, a large number of really crummy measurements if they're cheap. And of course, we know things aren't exactly case bars. How exactly do, do the, does it affect us as we deviate, from, deviate away from these assumptions or assumptions of known distributions and the like? All right, so those are the questions I want to answer. And out of this talk, I want you to get some insight into about how you can think about these types of questions. And the way I'm going to do it is I'm going to look at kind of the behavior of how the undersampling introduces uncertainty into our recovery problem. All right, so we'll first ask the question, how does undersampling add noise? First off, you can say, wait, what do you mean undersampling adds noise? Well, let's do an example. Okay, I've prepared a, an unknown signal for you guys. It's a 512 by 512 image. Okay, so we have a large number of unknown pixel values. Uh, okay, push the extreme limits with m equals zero measurements. Any guesses? <laughs> I heard one's a brain. Hmm? Okay, no other guesses. Huh? It says Duke, right? Okay, showing we have some. All right, maybe maybe this is the image, right? Girl in a hat. Okay, so we have some good, some good Bayesian priors here. And what, what image could I possibly have chosen? <laughs> okay. So look, we're going to do compressed sensing on it, okay? The first thing I want to do is think, we can think of this image as it's just a, it's just a, it's, it's a matrix. Let's just think of it as it's a bunch of columns, right? And we can stack the columns, the individual columns of our image on top of each other to create a single very large vector, okay? So this fits into our the initial thing I said, our unknown signal can be think of, thought of as a vector. Here, the number of pixels is given by the, the length of our vector is, given, vector is given by the total number of unknown pixels. Okay. Next, I'm going to allow us to take compressed sensing measurements. So I'm going to use a matrix. And here, I've chosen a matrix that's exactly, the height is exactly one half of the width. Okay, so I'm going to get away with, I'm, ta I'm taking, I'm undersampling by a factor of two. I'm getting half as many measurements as there are pixels in the image. Okay. Now, I'm not doing any more sleight of hand, right? 
The unknown signal is still gray. I'm not saying what it is. But here, this, this matrix I'm showing you, these, these different pixel intensities in the matrix correspond to the value of that coefficient in the matrix. Okay, so if it's very, I think, uh, light, it's a, it's a large value. If it's dark, it's a small value. And on the measurements, right, the intensity corresponds to the value of the measurement. So I realize these measurements might be hard to read, so here, I'll just show them to you again. Here, I plotted them out. So at this point, I've given you everything. Okay? I've given you the matrix, and I've given you the measurements. So, any guesses? Right? <laughs> you, you, the information's there. Now, you could argue, right? I, I didn't give you the scale on the measurements or on the matrix, but you can at least still recover something proportional to the true unknown signal, right? If, if that's all I want. Maybe I could just tell you, you know, it has zero mean or something. So still, any guesses? So all you have to do, right, is do the inverse computation in your head. Okay. Well, here, here, herein lies the problem of compressed sensing, is how should, we, how should we select a solution here, right? We know there's an infinite number of solutions which will work. What should we do? Um, you know, compressed sensing, I said one of the three keys was, incoher was well, incoherence. Okay, we have incoherence in our measurement matrix. We said uh, sparsity or compressibility. Well, I didn't tell you I was going to give you a sparse signal or a compressible signal. Okay, so we don't know if we have that. Right, that's, that's an unknown. Recovery algorithm, well, that's our choice. So here's what I'm going to propose. Before forgetting, you know, instead of trying to, you know, thinking I did something sparse, let's just, let's just go back to the basics. Say, let's try a linear recovery algorithm. And moreover, let's just make our life really easy. Let's not even bother with trying to create a pseudo-inverse, right? We can't, our matrix is not invertible. It's short and fat. But we have these different pseudo-inverses we could consider. Let's try one to just take the transpose of our matrix. Okay. This, I'm making, there's no matrix inversion here. So maybe it might be difficult for you to do it on fly as an audience, right? It's really easy on a computer. And there's no assumptions. Right. And this is, this is kind of what people would do. Now, is there any reason we expect this to work? I don't know. Let's just do it. <laughs> and here's what we see. Suddenly, it's almost like something, something comes up. We have some weird shape in there. It's like almost humanoid. <laughs> right? Now, this doesn't look like the image I probably selected ahead of time. Right? We don't think this is probably the right answer, but we have information, which is that this looks something like a very, very noisy version of a natural image. That is an image of something you might see in nature, a person that has had a bunch of noise thrown on top of it. That's information. That's useful information we didn't have before. So what do we know about natural images? Right? Before I said, we didn't know before if my image was sparse or not, or how it was sparse. What do you know about natural images? Are they sparse? How? In a wavelet domain, right? So natural images typically have some sparse representation if we look in the wavelet domain. So what we can do, kind of a natural thing to say, is, well, let's, let's transform it to the wavelet domain and then threshold it to get rid of some of this noise. It looks very noisy. So we're just going to more or less set all the small wavelet coefficients to zero and then shrink the larger ones. This is standard wavelet denoising. Here I'm using the soft thresholding function shown in the bottom left corner. And if we apply it to our linear estimate, this is what happens. Right? We get a denoised linear estimate. Okay, still not great. It looks a little different. We can see the shape a little bit better. We're starting to see what looks like a building in the background. Okay, so we, we just applied a linear estimate, and then we said, hey, it looks like a natural image. Let's try denoising it in the wavelet domain. We did that. Okay, so should we march onwards? What's the next step we can do? Well, this isn't exactly correct. We have some error. Okay, between what I'm showing here, this denoise version, and the true vector, which we still don't know. We could try and estimate that error using, again, our linear estimate from before, just hitting it with the transpose of the matrix. So we're going to you know, do this on the residual error that we see from the measurements. So here is y, our observed measurements, ax, the reconstruction we get with our current denoised estimate. And doing this, adding it back into our denoised estimate, we create a new estimate of what we think the signal could be. Okay? So I'm taking denoised plus estimate of error, Will this get better or worse? We don't know. We do it. And we get a very noisy image again. Okay. That's okay. Well, what I've just described is one iteration 
of an iterative algorithm known as uh, iterative soft thre thresholding. So the idea is that you, you alternate back and forth. First you try and create, say, a linear estimate, then you denoise it, and then you update your, your denoised estimate by doing a linear estimate of the error and back and forth. So you're trying to get the error, denoise, find your error, denoise. Okay. Um, and this algorithm has been around for a while. Uh, recently there's another algorithm called approximate message passing. Okay, approximate message passing is similar, but it has a, a certain correction term. I'm not gonna, just not going to show here to keep things simple. Uh, but th this correction term really, really improves the performance of their algorithm and really makes it go. So what I'm going to show you now is I'm going to run AMP, the approximate message passing, the correction term, and see exactly how our estimate evolves over the iterations. All right, so this was our first iterate, iteration, zero. Just look at the linear estimate. After our, second, after our first iteration, it's gotten a bit noisier. Okay, we apply our iteration a second time, a bit more clear, three. So we go along. Each time it seems like we still have some noisy version of an image, but somehow that noise is decreasing. We're getting a better and better look. So here after 18 iterations, you see it's James Duke standing in front of the Duke Chapel. And we did this, right? We just started with the linear and then did what made sense. Okay, how well did we do? Right? It's still possible. I gave you a system of linear, undue determined system of linear equations. There are an infinite number of solutions. Right? Do we think this is the correct solution? Well, yes. <laughs> Very close, okay? I have ground truth, so we can check. This is the original on the left. This is the estimate. Um, it's not exactly right, though. I mean, there's some errors. I don't know if you can see from here, but it's a little fuzzy in places. So we've reconstructed something very close, but not exact. What can we say about the, the difference, right, our reconstruction error? So now that I have ground truth, what I'm going to do is I want to look at a histogram of the errors across every pixel. So I'm just going to take the difference between these, think of this as a big collection of numbers, and say, what's the histogram of those errors? And I'm going to start, and I'm going to look at the histogram again across all the iterations. So this is, say, for the first iteration. Here's our, our histogram of errors. And remember, this is uh, an image that is like 256 different values. The dynamic range is between like 0 and 256. So you can have an error be between plus 256 or minus 256. So our first iteration, we see that the errors are kind of spread out. Right? This is a very noisy image. But the key thing is that the shape of this mound is a Gaussian. And it's hard to see here because it's very flat, but it has a Gaussian curve. In fact, let's see what happens in each iteration. Right? As we're going through the algorithm, at every stage, our errors, the difference between what we're estimating and truth, is Gaussian. Well, at least marginally Gaussian. And in fact, it's just the width of, these error, of the Gaussian distribution that's shrinking. Right? The width, the variance of this distribution is our mean squared error, since these, these errors are unbiased. They have zero mean. And so after 18 iterations, we have a noise that's relatively small. Well, much smaller than what we started with, but it's non-zero. Okay. So what I've just shown you, again, is the marginal distribution of the errors. How does it look if you just took the errors and put them in a bag and then said, you know, what do you get if you pull one out? But let's say, can we say more? What about the relationship between the errors and the signal itself? That is, is it possible that, you know, when the signal's large, we get large errors, and when the signal's small, we have small errors? Or are they somehow independent of each other? So to address this question, I'm going to show you a histogram of the true pixel values. Okay? This is the, the marginal distribution of our signal. And I'm going to compare it to the histogram of our estimated pixel values, again, going across iterations. So here at the beginning, we see that somehow our estimated pixel values, were all, at the very beginning, were all over the place. We could see that humanoid shape, but it was very noisy. Right? And that's reflected in a large amount of noise in our, in our histogram on the bottom. However, as we increase through the iterations, we're going to see a key fact. In fact, the histogram of our estimate is the original histogram convolved with a Gaussian kernel. Okay? So what does that mean? It's like you took that top histogram and just came along with that Gaussian, just smeared it and blurred it. Right? But as we increase the number of iterations, the width of that Gaussian kernel is getting narrower and narrower. We're getting a better look at the actual distribution. All right? So by the time after 18 iterations, Right? We have something that's very close. Now, that after 18 iterations, the distributions are similar is not a surprise. We saw the images looked alike. The key here is the form, is that at each stage, it was the original signal convolved with a Gaussian. What this is telling us is, in fact, that these errors 
is somehow independent of the original signal itself. It's not just that we have Gaussian errors, we have Gaussian errors that are independent of the signal. So the two kind of key takeaways we've gotten from this example is that from this undersampling and reconstruction with AMP, we have noise that is Gaussian and independent of the signal. Uh, this, this is surprising, at least, at least to me. You wouldn't think a priori that just by taking undersampled measurements, right, there was no noise in my initial setup, you would get not just Gaussian noise, but kind of approximately independent Gaussian noise. And the second thing we saw is that kind of what we care about now is, well, how, how much noise is it? Well, that's the noise power, is that it was decreasing with our iterations, but only to a point. So here I've I kind of spotted the standard deviation of the errors as a function of the iteration number. And we see that it, in fact, decreases, but then it bottoms out at about 5. Okay, so that's like an MSC of 25. So I guess kind of the big questions are, right, is this, you know, what is this noise and how small can we make it? And, and this is when we say, what can theory tell us, right? I just showed you an example. I didn't cheat on that example. I can give you the code, you could run it, but what will this tell you about your problems? <coughs> and this is where, if you get something kind of out of this talk, I want this next part to be kind of, what can theory say? How can you answer it and how you can get these insights? So here's the story. It says there's an equivalence between undersampling on the left, right? By undersampling, I mean number of knowns less than the number of unknowns, and a different model on the right. So on the right, I'm going to call direct observation, which is where you just see a noisy version of the signal. So on, on the right, there is no undersampling. The number of, of uh, measurements y is the same as the dimension of x. Right? You just have independent Gaussian noise to start with. So the problem on the right has been studied classically, and there's, there's a lot that's known about it you know, but from the statistics literature and so on. The one on the right is the one that's been more recent. Understanding this connection allows you to go between these two problems. Right? So the, the question should now be, you know, if you want to do compressed sensing, instead of asking, you know, okay, is, if I have this fraction of measurements and this fraction of sparsity, which, you know, which order result do I use? Instead of saying, for my setting, what's the effective noise I'm going to see? If I'm doing compressed sensing. And, and, and is there a way I can make that effective noise as small as possible? So what is the effective noise? Right? The effective noise is some function of the original noise. Here I'm saying in the general case, we could have also measurement errors in the undersampled case. And something that depends on the problem. Right? So it's going to depend on how much undersampling we do, this effective noise. It's going to depend on, actually, this, the unknown signal itself. Right? If this unknown signal is kind of difficult to recover, this effective noise will be large. If the, if the unknown signal is very compressible or very sparse, this unknown kind of interference term becomes very small. And it also depends on what recovery algorithm we use. So we saw we had an effective noise with just a linear estimate, but we also had an effective noise with doing multiple iterations of AMP. It was just much, much smaller. All right, so there's been a lot of different types of work trying to say, you know, not explicitly in the, the way I've set it up, but, but kind of showing how you can characterize exactly that this equivalence holds in a certain sense. That is, as far as the estimation is concerned, you can think about this noisy model. And also thinking about how much noise and, and how you get. So maybe I want to highlight is there's different ways of looking at this. The top line is heuristic analysis. So this is, this is powerful tools from statistical physics which let you kind of get in and say precisely what you think this noise would be, but they rely on some assumptions that, that aren't proven in the context of this problem. So it's kind of it's a heuristic, uh, non-rigorous um, analysis. In many special cases, if you think about certain types of matrices and settings, you can say things rigorously, and there's been a ton of work on this. Um, in some very interesting cases, and, you know, with, with random matrices or structured matrices, um, and also each of these are paired with, you know, different types of rec reconstruction techniques. Finally, you know, if you have some case that runs outside of the theory, right, you have some matrix that people haven't developed a theorem for yet, but you have precise analysis given by the theory. The theory says, I think your effective noise, if you use this algorithm with these parameters, will behave exactly like this, you have an explicit hypothesis that you can test experimentally using massive simulation. Okay? This is, again, different ways theory can be playing a role. And again, as I said, the questions you want to ask are, what I, you know, is how much noise do I have? And, and kind of why is this the important question is because somehow the amount of your effective noise determines your performance across a wide variety of performance, of recovery tasks. Right, so you can kind of think of saying, what I want to do is give my measurements, produce an estimate that has the minimum amount of effective noise. 
Now I'm going to do some reasonable processing for whatever I'm trying to do, be it detection, classification, uh, regression, or prediction. And as I said before, the amount of effective noise depends on degree of undersampling, recovery method, uh, original noise, and complexity of underlying object. Okay, so the name of the game now is find the effective noise. One way to do this, okay, this is so some work I did when, um, in my PhD thesis, a lot of that was based on looking at a particular detection problem. So it says, forget about this whole undersampling causes noise. Let's just say, how well, if we have a sparse signal, can we find the locations of the non Okay, In a given problem regime, in the interesting regimes, um, you know, it's, it's hard to get exact recovery because there's noise and uncertainty, but you can get some fraction correct. You can get an error rate, right, where you say, oh, I got 99% accuracy. So you look at exactly and say, how well does that detection error rate behave as a function of your problem parameters? It turns out that by using tools and understanding that problem very carefully and precisely, you can then reinterpret it and get bounds on your effective noise. Okay, so that's one way to understand the effective noise is by studying a particular recovery task. Um, and it's rigorous. Okay. What I'm going to show you, though, this is a, is a different way. Okay, so this is going to be a, a combination of two different techniques. One is using heuristics from statistical physics, and the other is using rigorous analysis of a certain fixed but potentially suboptimal algorithm, AMP. All right, so what am I showing you here? I'm plotting a function. This function, we can call it Gibbs-free energy, it has a parameter tau. Okay? This tau squared is going to play the role of our effective noise. And we want to find the effective noise. So we'd like it if our effective noise tau squared is small, so far to the left. We're unhappy if it's large, far to the right. This term I plotted is a function of our problem parameters. Okay? The degree of undersampling. Um, sigma squared represents the, if there's any initial measurement noise in our problem. And finally, there's a mutual information between a random variable. This is a scalar random variable, x, and x plus Gaussian noise. Uh, the distribution of x is dictated by the, uh, the marginal distribution of our signal. So the claim is, is that we can get an exact expression for our effective noise by looking at this function. We plot it and we ask, where are the minimums of this function? Okay. So in this case, the minimum is clearly the part where I, I drew both a, a red dot and a blue circle. So here's, the inter here's what the minimums mean. AMP, that iterative algorithm I was showing you before, it says that the effective noise you will get is the largest minimum. So you find any local minimum on this function, find the one that's furthest to the right, that is the effective noise you get from AMP. Now imagine that instead of running AMP, we'd have run some, maybe a Bayes optimal estimator, right? Like the conditional expectation that knew something about the distribution of our signal ahead of time. Okay, this is a potentially different algorithm. And how would it perform? Well, now, according to the, this is, comes from the, the replica analysis in the statistical physics says, what you get here is a minimum, but not just the worst minimum, the global minimum. So wherever this function is smallest, that's the value. Okay, so there's two different expressions for effective noise corresponding to two different recovery algorithms. And in this case, well, there's the worst, the largest minimum is also the global minimum, they're the same. Okay, so that's our effective noise. What happens if we start thinking about different distributions or changing our, our problem regime? So here I'm just going to change the distribution and see what happens to our functional and the locations of the minimum. Okay? So here's another one. In fact, when I'm doing it, I'm just, I'm just scaling up the power of my distribution. Okay? So I'm growing it, growing it, until suddenly we hit to a point where we have two local minima and suddenly which one was the global minimum jumped. And what's happened here is that the difference between the blue circle and the red dot changed. What this is saying is that before, when these circles coincided, the AMP algorithm was doing the optimal recovery. It was getting the Bayes MMSE. Okay? But suddenly, once we get into a different distribution, it became a difference. AMP is highly suboptimal. If we could compute, which is potentially computationally very expensive, right, the Bayes rule, we'd be getting performance, very good performance, very small effective noise. But using our suboptimal algorithm, we're stuck with large noise. Okay? So this is a precise characterization of the effective noise. All right, so this 
achieves kind of the first goal of my talk, which was to say, how does undersampling affect you? Well, it's, it introduces this independent Gaussian noise, and the amount of noise is related to what you're doing. You'd like to do something intelligent, but you, know, you don't necessarily know the underlying signal distribution. What can we do? So the second part, maybe now, motive is, well, what can we do about this? If we know there's this effective noise, how can we harness tools you know, that we know or new tools to say, let, let's make it small? And I'm going to show you two cases here, two different approaches. So one is kind of, you know, know your enemy and, and prepare for the worst. Right? So that is if we, we know kind of, we might not know the distribution, but we know it has some constraints, plan for the worst distribution and do the best thing you can in that case. And the other case we'll see is uh, try and learn something about the distribution using the independence in your errors. So for the first thing, we can think of a, a game against nature. Right? So the idea here is, you know, imagine that, that out there nature is trying to, to hurt you, is trying to use, find a, a distribution or a signal in some class that's, that's going to make your MSE as large as possible. Right? Your goal is to get a good reconstruction, so as the engineer, statistician, scientist, curious observer, right? you want to minimize the mean squared error. You want to get the best reconstruction. So there's one option. Here we could say, maybe nature plays first. Okay, so this is, if you think nature um, says, OK, I'm going to pick a signal. And then you say, OK, I'm going to pick an estimator for that signal. Now, if nature just picks a signal, it's kind of easy. You just output whatever signal nature picked. But here you think nature picks a distribution, some class of, say, you know, uh, a random signal, a distribution. You're given that distribution. You don't know which exact signal it is, so you want to come up with some uh, rule that works well. Right? On average, over that class, that, of course, is the Bayes um, optimal rule. And so here we can think of this as, you know, kind of the setting of the worst case behavior you can get in the Bayesian setting. Again, I'm just going to put here the, the we're maxing, taking the max over all signals in some class, right? So a class could be the class of sparse signals. A class could be of signals with bounded uh, complexity where you use some other measure of complexity, maybe entropy, maybe Kolmogorov complexity. Um, again, in a class of estimators, we can think of this as maybe we're using AMP and I'm trying to think about the different threshold to choose in my soft thresholding. Maybe I'm using AMP and I'm trying to think about what denoising function to use. It doesn't have to be soft thresholding. Maybe I'm using lasso and trying to think what regularization parameter. Maybe it's the class of all possible estimators. I'm unconstrained by any computational constraints. These are all interesting questions. On the other hand, what if we have to commit first, right? We really don't know what the distribution is. And nature gets to, um, so we, we commit to our estimator, then nature chooses the worst case signal for that distribution. Oh, jumped ahead of myself. OK, so this one on the right, this is going to be the min-max. Right? So what's the relationship between these two? Well, since we swap the order, right, one game is more favorable than the other, we always have that one is larger than the other. Um, what's interesting, is that in many cases, there exists a saddle point. That is, the optimal strategy in, in both cases doesn't change given on who plays first, and we, in fact, have an equality here. So a, a fundamental question is, is, to what extent is this an inequality versus an equality? Um, other cases are interesting, and um, it's a bit of an open question. I'm not going to answer it today, uh, but there's a lot more that can be said about that. I also want to mention why studying these types of formulations is interesting. Okay? On the left-hand side, if you have a prior distribution which achieves the supremum, it's a least favorable prior. Okay? It's useful to know what this least favorable prior is because as the interpretation, it's the most difficult prior for compressed sensing in this problem regime. If you're going to do simulations, which people do all the time, you know, they apply it to a signal and they say, and we generate our signal according to this distribution. Well, it'd be convincing if you, could, if you could run your simulations with the worst distribution, if you want to show me that your algorithm really works. On the other hand, on the right-hand side, right, the solution to here, if you have an algorithm, an estimator that's minimax over a certain class of distributions or signals, right, this has the interpretation of, you know, if all you know is that your signal lives in that class, you should use this method if you want to minimize, if you want to be guaranteed that you're not going to have the worse, uh, an even worse uh, performance. So you have a uniform upper bound that holds uniformly over a whole class. All right, so here's one special case. As I talked about before, we know things are not exactly K sparse. So what if you relax the sparsity and you say, I have something that's not exactly sparse, but close to sparsity in some sense. 
Um, and so this is uh, some recent work I did with David Donahoe. And the way we measure close to sparsity is to say that, you know, the best, say, k-term approximation of your vector, that is the best k-sparse approximation, well, the error lives in some LP, body, uh, LP ball of a given radius. Right? So P kind of controls how your, your ball behaves, and uh, the radius says how large your deviation is. So in fact, what we show is that here there is a saddle point. Right? That is, if you're using recovery with AMP, there is an optimal threshold you choose as a function of the class, or there's a worse distribution in that class for any given th threshold, and there's a saddle point uh, in your strategies. Moreover, we can give an explicit, you know, we can compute exactly what this minimax MSE is. And so here I'm showing the contours. Um, there's, there's a, you know, the, this minimax MSE depends on, right, a number of parameters, right? Initial noise, undersampling, deviation, right? So here I'm just showing it as a function of the deviation from strict sparsity and kind of the uh, measurement noise. It's another case, right? We can think about noise sensitivity. Right? Remember when I said we have a nonlinear algorithm? A big problem with nonlinear recovery is we want to worry about stability. Well, a little bit of noise cause our error to blow up. And so with the noise sensitivity, you can think of as the worst case over all noise levels of how much that little bit of change in noise can affect your change in recovery and your mean squared error. Now what we're going to look at here is the minimax noise sensitivity over all possible algorithms, no constraints. Um, and it turns out this is a non-trivial problem because if I showed you before, right, we had one expression which had these minimizers, and there was this global minimizer, but as you change the distribution, where this global minimum is can jump around. What we show here is we get upper and lower bounds on the minimax noise sensitivity. So we have an upper bound on the min-max, a lower bound on the max-min. And interestingly, if we go back to what I asked at the very beginning, how many measurements do you need for exact recovery with no noise, k plus 1? What our bounds show is that how many measurements do you need for stable recovery in noise? And the answer is k plus 1. Well, actually k plus 2 in a very interesting sense. But uh, approximately it's the same, OK? So a lot of the results in compressed sensing said you get sta stability only if the number of measurements is much, much larger than k plus 1. Here we're saying, actually, no, you can get stability at a fundamental level, universally over all k sparse signals, right? As long as you just have more than the k plus 1, though the, the, the coefficient of your stability could, is blowing up. It could be very large. All right, so those are two kind of examples of how you can do minimax bounds. And again, there's, there's a lot more you can look at there. Um, I'm just trying to, you know, maybe advertise and make you think, well, this is interesting and worth looking at. But I think another question we can do is, let's go back to what we did at the very beginning. I had, we had an unknown signal. We didn't know anything about it. And then I just hit it with a linear estimate, and we looked at it. And then we looked at it, even though there had all this noise, we said something. We said, hey, this looks like a natural image. Let's use wavelet denoising. What were we doing there? We were using, we were looking at the data and using something about what we saw to motivate what we were going to do next in our recovery technique. Okay, we were adapting to the signal. If we looked at it and saw that, it, you know, maybe there were a few components that were very large, but it looks like it was just like sparse plus noise, we wouldn't have done denoising in the wavelet domain. If we'd done it and saw something that was clearly it had re repeating frequencies, right, we might have done denoising in the, the Fourier domain. So what can we learn? And can we kind of harness the fact that this noise is independent of the signal itself such that we can learn certain properties of the signal? So here's an example where we have, again, the true distribution above of a signal. And below, we have a histogram <coughs> of an estimate that we did maybe from some recovery technique. Maybe it's linear. Maybe we ran lasso or something. But we're looking at it, and, and we're looking um, at the, of what we see. Okay. Could we say, well, if we know that the histogram of our estimate as I said before, you take the histogram of the true right, distribution, you convolve it with a Gaussian kernel. So if we want to learn the distribution, great, we just deconvolve from our, our Gaussian kernel and we're done. Right? We see the distribution, then we can do the optimal um, <clears throat> behavior. Right? I'm saying we can just deconvolve, see the distribution, apply Bayes' rule, right? and so max min equals min max and the other problem and we're done. Okay. There's a problem here, which is that deconvolution is not easy. And moreover, these aren't exact, right? These are discrete distributions. If you actually convolve something with the, with, the, with the Gaussian, you're going to have a continuous distribution. So you have to do some smoothing, and then you have to worry about your errors. And in fact, it's very 
hard to stably estimate distribution and then argue that the errors don't propagate uh, into your recovery technique, okay? So this isn't case closed. But there's a lot that's known about these types of problems. So let's, let's say, look, do we really need to estimate the unknown signal distribution or do we just need to figure out the right thing to do? So we can say, let's make it easier. Can we just figure out the optimal denoiser, the optimal rule to apply, right? Without ever worrying about what the distribution is. And this, it turns out, you can do. You can do this in a stable manner. And so again, this is more recent work. And uh, maybe just to highlight, you know, part of the idea is, is you think of a starting point, you know, some results such as even if you want to just compute a conditional expectation, you don't need to know the underlying distribution of what you're looking at. If it's corrupted by additive Gaussian noise, all the information is contained in the density, kind of the, the, the distribution of the noisy version itself. If you have a good estimate of that, you can plug it in and get a, a, a good estimate of your Bayes rule. Okay, so again, that, that was kind of the sampler platter of things we can do, right? Think about minimax stability, kind of figure out where do we have equality, what are the exact performance, what are the worst distributions, and on the other hand, think about ways that we can adapt to and learn from the signal. This is very natural in the example where we looked at it and said once we saw the first noisy version, we could do something reasonable with it um, after that. So uh, again, this is the outline of my talk, and, and this concludes what I wanted to convey to you. Um, so at this point, I'm happy if there's, there's any questions about anything. So. I argued that the noise was marginally Gaussian. Did you talk about the um, possible correlation between noise at different points? Is there any kind of spatial structure to the... Right, so the question is, I argued that the noise was marginally Gaussian. And so the first way I argued that was just showing the marginal distribution of the noise and saying, hey, it's Gaussian. Well, the question is, 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 is it correlated with the signal? So then I tried to show you a bit more information by showing you the uh, joint distributions on the original signal. I'm not asking about correlation with the signal, but correlation between the noise. Oh, right, right. The other question is, is the, is the noise itself independent? And, okay. There's, a, there's an obvious answer to this, which is no. The noise cannot be independent. In fact, everything I said can't be exactly true because at the end of the day, we had a system of underdetermined linear equations, right? So, and, you know, it's deterministic and, in fact, you know, if you know these equations right by the end, you know, you're going to learn something about the next step. Okay. So everything that I said is true approximately, right, in the fact that they are going to be correlated, but in a weak sense, and this correlation is spread out amongst everyone. So you don't, it's not like you have, because if you think about the, uh, generating a random measurements, they're kind of very democratic. Each one kind of has a similar amount of information. The noise is very weakly correlated, and for any, if we look at any two pairs, right, then you two adjacent indices say, you know, let's look at noise at value 1 and noise at 2, pixel 2, right? The correlation between them will be tending to 0 as the problem size becomes large. For any fixed subset of indices, the correlation between the noise will be converging to an independent Gaussian noise. So the exact form of that convergence is, is not something I said explicitly. Can you also say a couple of words in terms of uh, what would happen in, in, a, in, a real, in, in a realistic environment where, where the actual interference noise would tend to be colored? And the other thing is when the measure, measurement matrix itself would tend to be colored. Right. And not so independently. Distributed. Right. So, the, so the, here's the key. What you kind of need, for what I said, to really be the meaningful, I think, is you need this incoherence in a statistical sense. You need either the matrix to kind of have, you know, interchangeable columns and rows, which are independent of the signal. So if you imagine that the signal does not depend on the matrix, it's out there and you have some generic matrix, then that will be enough. And in fact, this, this incoherence between them will mean that your, your statistical, kind of the, the noise, the effective noise, will again be uh, approximately independent and, and uncorrelated. Alternatively, for a fixed matrix, if you have enough randomness in your signal again, this is enough to break it. The problem is, is that if you have correlations between the two. Okay. And that is where the theory will break down, as, as you'd expect it to do. Exactly, right? If we have a sparse signal and we measure it using just, you know, a few, the, the first couple rows of the identity matrix, we will fail, right? Because it's coherent sampling, right? We're trying to avoid coherence. 
So how to say precisely what happens when we have these dependencies becomes difficult theoretically. And I think this is one of the, one of the benefits of having a precise theory in the independent case that it gives you a testable hypothesis, right? Where you can say exactly what you know, exactly what you expect the best tuning parameters to be, run it, see if it works. If it doesn't work, you know, there's evidence that you don't, you know, you're kind of in a bad regime. If it does work, well, works. Is there any work done on Poisson noise in particular? Yes, there's, there's lots of recent noise work, uh, work done on Poisson noise. Yeah. Right. I'm not fully familiar with it, but... Uh, well, I'd like to thank uh, Galen again, Professor Reeves, for this uh, very interesting tour uh, of a problem that's been around for a while but is no less important or than ever as, as data proliferates, how to deal with, it, deal with less of it and, and get more out of it. So thanks for that interesting tour. Let's thank you. <laughs>